Hello and welcome. My name is Ayotunde, also known as ATM, and you're welcome to my channel once again. If this is your first time uh, watching a video on this channel, I would say you're in the right place. And if you're a returning subscriber, um, welcome back. As I mentioned in my last video where I outlined the five steps to starting your Australian skilled migration journey, um, here I'll be talking about the first step. And um, if you have not watched the last video, I would encourage you to pause this and go watch that one first. It's more of a prerequisite and it gives you a better understanding of this video. So a quick recap, um, there are five steps to starting your Australian skilled migration journey. So we are analyzing the first one, which is the profile review. This stage involves identifying the occupation or occupations you can nominate, the assessing authority, the visa options available to you, and the English test required, and your probable total points. These are to check if you are eligible and can meet the requirement to obtain a skilled visa. To identify your occupation, you need to check the occupation list. You can simply do this by using Google search or go to anzosearch.com website and just click on the three list and go through the entire list. You need to check the title as well as the task involved in this occupation. Sometimes the title and the task or the task usually can be misleading. Um, I'll give a typical example. Um, if you see marketing specialist on the occupation list and you are a bank marketer in the Nigerian banking industry, you may think, oh, this is the same thing that I do. However, um, it's different because a marketing specialist does not sell or attend to customers. They are more of the research, they do more of research and the marketing campaign to get things rolling. So people who sell are actually like calls sales rep or sales agent. So it's, it's a bit different. Another example is that you may also have your occupation and have and see multiple occupations that you can nominate. A typical example is a site engineer in a construction company. Because you're a site engineer, you probably have a civil engineering degree. So that means you may be able to nominate civil engineer civil engineering drafts person or civil engineering technician or you can even nominate construction project manager depending on your role in the organization so you need to assess the occupation that you can meet the requirement and at the same time you have a better chance of getting a visa subclass a better visa subclass or a faster nomination now let's talk about the skilled visa options. So I'll be talking about the common ones because Australia has over 60 uh, visa categories. And, um, but I'll be focusing more on the, the skilled visa. And this skilled visa is broken into two, which is the, the employer sponsored and the skilled independent uh, or state sponsored visa. So if we focus mainly on the independent or the state sponsored visa, there are four and they include 189, 190, 491 and 476. Australia usually uses um, three digits number for their visa um, types. Now let's talk about this um, four visa class. As you can see from the table, um, we can see the four um, visa types and the various categories. The first one is the category of the visa. 189 and 190 are categorized as permanent resident visa. 491 and 476 are but, um, te um, temporary visa. Validity. If you're on 189 or 190, your visa is valid for five years because it's PR Although it is valid for life, which means it automatically renews every five years. But at a point, at every point in time, it is valid for five years, but it automatically renews the validity. However, 491 is valid for five years. After five years, they expect that you would have graduated to 
another visa if you don't graduate to another visa then you have to get a visa or you leave australia or come back again with another visa 476 is only valid for 18 months it's a is a, it's a visa for only engineering uh, graduates and um, the citizenship requirement for all these visa is that after four years you are eligible for citizenship in australia if you're a permanent residence and for 491 you are eligible for citizenship after four years if you have lived on a permanent residence visa for at least 12 months in the last before that four years so for example you get enough for now one and after three years you're eligible to apply for pr which is the one time 191 visa it takes you maybe after three months that you have applied your visa is approved you become a permanent resident so technically you'll be eligible for citizenship um, after four years and three months because of course it took you if, about three months to get your visa the one i want approved so that means you get your citizenship eligibility after four years and three months for 476 as long as you move on to another pr visa you are you only need to live in australia for four years to be eligible for citizenship um on the point calculator 189 you don't get any extra points so that means you need to work hard and get the points on your own for 190 which is state sponsored you get an extra five point for 491 which is the state territory sponsored visa you get an extra 15 points that is not applicable to 476 and the other thing is the occupation list so there are three lists for the skilled migration list you have the ml tssl list which is the medium and long-term skilled list and you also have the sdsol which is the short-term skilled occupation list you can just google this words very easy and you get the list um, popping up on google for you then rl is the regional occupation list uh, when your occupation is on mltssl list it means you can nominate 189 190 or 491 if your occupation is on rol it means you can only do 491 so the work right that is applicable to all these visas is that there is no limitation you can work in any industry no restrictions at all there is no time limit so you can do 100 hours or 40 hours or 30 hours it's up to you um location if you have 189 you can live anywhere 190 you can also live anywhere although you have an obligation to live in the state that has sponsored you but for 491 you you can live anywhere except for sydney melbourne and brisbane you can live in any of those three locations but you can live in any other location 476 allows you to live anywhere but most people because they're engineering degree most people either stay in melbourne or sydney so um the benefit that accrues to you as a 190 or 189 order because you're a permanent residence is you get the government benefit which is center link and uh, you also get Medicare, which is the medical and um, the free medical um, option So you get that um, for free as well. And you can uh, you can study as a local person. So you are considered a resident. So you pay local fee. If you're on 491, you are considered an international, a foreigner, technically, because you're on a temporary resident visa. So you need to pay international school fees if you want to study on 491. And same with 476 as well. Um, if you want to buy a property as well or buy a house or any form of any property in Australia on 491 or any temporary resident visa, you would pay for FIRB, which is the um, foreign residence um, payment that you have to pay to show that you're a foreigner. So you pay those, you pay extra compared to what a permanent resident or a citizen would pay for if they were buying the same property. So those are the um, distinctions between those four visa categories and those are the major ones. The other type of visa which I showed earlier is the, 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 the employer sponsored visas. Those ones you need an employer to sponsor you. I'm going to touch base on some of them later on um, in the later series. After you have identified your occupation and the visa options available to you, the assessing authority is usually in the ANZO website. You can just click on it and it takes you straight to the assessing authority. 
website so you can see what the requirement of your assessing authority what their requirements are um, there are about 504 occupations in the occupation list and 40 assessing bodies with different requirements so that means um, a doctor has a different requirement to a medical laboratory scientist so each of these assessing body have different requirement i'll give a typical example um, a secondary school teacher with who is assessing with AITSL would require an IELTS academic um, English resort. But if a music teacher is assessing with VetAssess, they don't need English test to do the assessment. They can write their English test later on to lodge an expression of interest. But for assessment, they don't need it. Meanwhile, for a secondary school teacher who teaches any other subject would need an IELTS academic. In a case where you have an occupation, like I mentioned earlier, a site engineer who, has, who can nominate about four occupations, you now need to consider which occupation will give you, will give you the best result. Um, so you need to consider which assessing authority you can meet their requirement and which um, one will give a faster nomination or a better visa subclass. I would list a few of those assessing bodies because, I, like I said, there are 40. So I'll probably talk about five of them, which are the most common ones, and give you an overview. So the first one is Vocational Education and Training Assessment, which is called VetAssess. This has about more than 80% of the occupation that they, know, that they assess for. But their major requirement is you must have at least one year experience. The other one is Australian Computer Society, ACS. Um, they assess computer science um, majors, um, so business analysts, software developers, etc. Uh, those are the occupations that they assess. Their requirement is that you need to have, usually have a major degree in computer science and at the same time have pension or tax, tax statement from the government, which is maybe from your pension company or from the tax authority of the country or the state you are working. Another common one is the Australian Institute of Medical and Clinical Scientists, AIMS. Um, they assess for medical laboratory scientists. One of their requirements is that you must have English test result, IELTS, and you must also have, um, I think, two years experience before you can assess with them. So if you don't have two years experience, you cannot assess with them. Another popular one is Engineers Australia. It's the assess for all engineering occupation. And um, they require that you have um, an engineering qualification as well. And at the same time, have um, pension or tax statement that they can verify. Um, I will move on to another one as well, which is AITSL, um, they are the Australia Institute of um, Teaching um, and Special Languages. So they do um, more of all the teaching occupations. Like if you're a teacher, you need to assess with them. Their requirement is that you must have IELTS academic and you must have done teaching, pra teaching practice. So if you are a teacher and you have not done teaching practice before, you, do not, you don't have a degree in education, they won't assess your qualification. Finally, I'm going to be talking about Trades Recognition Australia, which is TRA. Um, this assessing body assesses all occupations that are related to trades like carpenter, furniture, man, cabinet maker, bricklayers, and etc. Um, they assess those occupations. Their requirement is that you must have three years experience with that is very, very, very verifiable with pay slips, um, pension tax, at least you must have two pay evidence. And at the same time, you must also um, have qualification that relates to that experience. If you are a hairdresser and you don't have a qualification that shows that you are a hairdresser, you won't get a positive assessment with them. You need to have evidence, maybe a trade test certificate that shows that, oh, you actually did a training. Um, those are the common ones. Uh, we can always talk about them because um, um, there is a lot about 40 of them. They have different requirements. So you need to understand the requirement for the occupation you are going for. And you ensure that you meet those requirements before you pay or submit your application. I know I have said a lot of information that may be confusing, um, but don't worry. I have added um, some links to the description that you can go 
go to and read uh, more information so that you can understand better. Moving on to the next point, which is the English test. Um, I usually get uh, people question me and, say, and ask, oh, um, do I need to write English test? And my response is, yes, you need to write English test. So you can't escape it, except if you are the secondary applicant or you have a UK, US, um, New Zealand, Canada or Ireland passport. If you don't have any of those five or six passports, then you will need to write uh, an English test. But there are five types. You can write five English tests, so they are, you have variety. So IELTS, which is the common one, Pearson test of English, uh, which is PTE. Then you also have Cambridge, OET or TOEFL. So either of those five, you can sit for any of those five exams to get your English test uh, result. I would let you know the common ones um, that people go for is usually PT and IELTS. Um, I did PT. My assessing authority does not have a spec does not have English test requirement. For teachers, you need IELTS academic. Um, for accountant, you need IELTS academic. Um, so there's specific requirement according to assessing body. But for the uh, migration skilled migration generally, you can write either of those five test and you'll be fine. So now let's talk about the five levels of this English test. The first one is called the functional English. This is the baseline or the basic one. Usually the secondary applicant have this score. So it's like 4.5 in IELTS or 30 in PT. And the next one is vocational English is a step above the functional English. The third one is the competent English. This is where you should start from if you are the primary applicant. You should not have anything less than competent English. Competent English gives you no point. It's a zero point on the points calculator. However, it's a start. It's, it's a good start. But you need to improve your score to get a better chance. The competent English is IELTS 6 in IELTS. So if you have six, a minimum of 6 in IELTS, that is competent English. If you have a minimum of 50 in each of your band in PTE, that is competent as well. The fourth um, step or fourth, fourth level is proficient English. This gives you 10 points on the point calculator. Um, when you are calculating your total point, you get extra 10 points for having this score. That means you have at least 7 in your IELTS. Then the last stage is um, superior English. If you have superior English, that means you have 20 points on the point calculator and you, you must have scored eight in each of the band, a minimum of eight in each of the IELTS band or 79 in PTE. There are two things that you need to um, consider when you are taking your English test. For Australia skilled migration, the result is valid for three years, even though the result will state that is valid for two years. But if you score from competent, proficient or superior, any of those um, last three, um, it's valid for three years. The second thing about it is that Australia only work with the least score. So if you have 999 and you have 6.5 in your last band in your IELTS, that is zero point because you have something less than seven. If you have 999, you have 7, that is 10 points. If you have 999 and you have 8, that is 20 points because your least score is 8. So Australia works with your least score on your results. So those are the two things that you need to consider or take note of um, when you are calculating your point. Now to wrap up this first step, the last thing you need to do is to calculate your point. I'm going to be doing a bonus video sometimes um, this week to talk about how to just to talk about the how to calculate your point on the point table. Pretty much um, very easy. Um, when you calculate your point and you get a minimum of 65 points, then you can tell yourself that you're ready. If you're able to get that, uh, you're good to go. If you're not able to, then you need to start working out how to improve your scores to get the 65, uh, minimum 65 point. So watch out for more videos in this series. I'll be talking more about the second step 
and talk about how to calculate your point as well. So um, another thing that I'm also going to be introducing is the um, a YouTube question and answer live session. Um, and so that is likely going to happen on Easter Monday and there will be subsequent sessions as well. So if you are not yet hit the subscribe button, I would encourage you to do that now. Hit the subscribe button, like, comment, share. I'm also going to be in the comment session as well. So um, thank you so much for watching up to this point and I will see you in my next video.